Hi, my name is Maitre Patel. I work at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. And my talk today is Go With the Flow, Vascular Considerations in Scrotal Imaging. So I have no disclosures to make. Vascular considerations play an important role in evaluation of the scrotum. And in today's talk, I'll be able to talk to you about the anatomy and technique of imaging the scrotum, torsion, epididymal orchitis, and evaluation of a mass uh, with vascular considerations. We won't have time to talk about varicoceles or trauma, but vascular considerations also play a role in evaluating of those entities. The arterial supply to the testis is primarily through the testicular artery, which gives rise to these capsular vessels, which then ramify into the testicular parenchyma, and then drain through the pampiniform plexus through the mediastinum testis. There are two other arteries that supply structures that are around the testis, and that includes the artery of the ductus deferens and the cremasteric artery. All of these three vessels come through to the testicle and its surrounding structures through the spermatic cord. And we can take images of this on ultrasound and see the capsular vessels and the ramifying vessels uh, with great clarity. What I'd like to do first is tell you a little bit about the Doppler technique that's uh, used when evaluating the scrotum. Obviously, we want to use the highest frequency transducer, uh, apply the lowest filter, and the lowest pulse repetition frequency, which basically means the lowest Doppler scale when we're evaluating for color flow. We don't have any concerns about power settings, and so we'll use the highest power setting. And I think it's important to capture both color Doppler and spectral Doppler images. So it's important not only to get those other images and this image that shows the vessels within the testicular parenchyma, but also to apply a Doppler gate and to demonstrate the spectral waveform, because that can be also useful in evaluating any pathology. What isn't commonly done, but what is important to understand, is that uh, the scrotum can also be imaged with MR. And uh, technique is just as important to get right when you evaluate the scrotum with MR. You want to support the scrotum with sponge or towels. Uh, use a pelvic phased array coil or a surface coil. And typically, the best images are the fast spin echo T2 weighted images um, that we do in three planes. Gadolinium enhanced images are very important in evaluating scrotal pathology. Uh, and we typically will do these with a gradient echo series in the coronal or sagittal plane and get three of the following possible time frames. In our lab, we'll do them at 60, 120, and 180 seconds. We'll do subtraction images, and then finally we'll get delayed gadolinium enhanced T1 images. And so here are some representative images of a normal scrotal MR examination in the coronal and in the axial plane. And you can see that the anatomy is really well depicted with very homogeneous appearance of the testes uh, and a slightly heterogeneous uh, but typical location for the epididymis and other paratesticular structures. And the dynamic gadolinium enhanced images uh, are not that revealing in a normal case, as you can see in this instance, uh, where these sagittal images were obtained before administration of contrast and then at 30, 60, and 90 seconds after the administration of contrast. And you can see progressive enhancement of these structures. But since there's no pathology here, uh, there's really nothing to demonstrate other than that. Now, Wat Nabi back in 2000 uh, had an excellent article that described the normal dynamic MRI appearance. And, and this is a somewhat complicated figure that is in their article. Uh, but if you were to take images in the gradient uh, echo plane uh, at 60, 120, and 180 seconds as we do, you can see that you're typically on the slope of the enhancement curve. And because of that, you can, by way of getting those images, uh, talk about relative percent peak height of enhancement and relative percent mean slope of enhancement. Uh, 
Now, to boil this down into very simple terms, all we're really talking about is evaluating how much the testis enhances and how fast it enhances. And so if you're going to compare one testis to the other or an area of suspected pathology to an area that's suspected to be normal, we can see and measure the percent of the peak height or how much it enhanced in that area and how fast it enhanced in that area. So let's apply these Doppler and MR techniques to evaluating three important conditions. And the first is torsion. Now, testicular torsion is mistakenly considered the most common cause of acute scrotal pain in children. But that's not true. Uh, the most common cause of acute scrotal pain in children, as we will discuss later, is actually torsion of the appendix epididymis or the appendix testis, not the testis itself. Torsion of the testis is associated with the bell clapper deformity, and this is the condition in which the vaginal tunica encircles the entire testis, and I'll demonstrate with uh, figures exactly what that means. Note that torsion can occur between the testis and the epididymis due to a long mesorchium. So this is less common, but in this instance, if torsion were to occur between the testis and the epididymis, you would still have blood flow to the epididymis, but would not have blood flow to the testis. On the other hand, more commonly what you get is torsion where both the testis and the epididymis are involved in the torsed segment. And so this schematic diagram and this uh, altered image through the uh, scrotum uh, on ultrasound kind of shows you the way the scrotum is attached, the way the testis is attached to the scrotal wall. The tunica vagina encircles the testis, but there's a bare area in which vessels come into the testicular parenchyma, uh, and also the epididymis lies, as you can see here. And typically, this is fairly broad, uh, but also in a longitudinal plane, it goes from the top to the bottom of the scrotum. So this image, which is taken uh, schematically through the middle of the testis, shows you this connection, and this runs up and down the testis, uh, and up and down the scrotal sac, as we can um, imagine. And so here, this connection, although seemingly thin, actually runs up above and well below this particular image. And so it serves to anchor the testis to the scrotal wall so that it can't flip. But if that connection is very short, meaning it doesn't run very high up and very far down the testicular wall, the scrotal wall, then you get a condition where it can twist on this and cause torsion. Torsion has some risk factors. Uh, this usually or more commonly occurs in adolescence, but note that it really can occur at any age. It is thought to be sometimes initiated by a forceful cremasteric contraction. So trauma, arousal, and strenuous activity have all been purported to be incipient events that can lead to torsion. But note that this can also just occur spontaneously. The hallmark of the scrotal sonographic findings in torsion is absence of blood flow. Uh, early or partial torsion can result in decreased but not absent blood flow. Uh, but the flow is really what dictates the finding. And so this precedes the grayscale findings. However, by the time uh, patients come to the emergency room with their pain, uh, that can often progress, and so you'll have typically epididymal congestion, a swollen hypoechoic testis, or even heterogeneous testicular parenchyma representing ischemia of the testis itself that can manifest with sonographic findings. So here is a representative example. We can see that the left testis is torsed. It's swollen. There is no demonstrable blood flow. Nor is there any blood flow in the epididymis or other paratesticular structures in this case, other than a small amount of flow here, which presumably is coming from one of the other arteries. Now, remember that all the arteries come through the spermatic cord, and so it's not the arterial twist, typically, that leads to the absence of blood flow. What happens is the twist in the, in the structure that supports the, the scrotum, uh, the testicle, uh, leads to a vascular venous kinking uh, 
that impedes venous outflow through the testicular parenchyma, and that's why we're not seeing any blood flow in the testis or the epididymis in this case, but we're still seeing some blood flow in the paratesticular tissues as compared to the opposite normal side where we see normal blood flow. And if this progresses, as it has in this case, this becomes quite heterogeneous in the testis infarcts, but more of the heterogeneity is due to the swollen, heterogeneous, hemorrhagic appearance of the epididymis and the cord that is in the torsed segment. The degree of torsion can vary, and so the salvageability varies depending on not only the degree of torsion, but how long the testis has been torsed. Animal studies have shown that if you have a complete torsion of the testis, within the first four hours, if you relieve that torsion, the testis remains viable, whereas after 10 hours, the testis is completely infarcted. However, in humans, in the natural state, typically the degree of torsion isn't complete, and so even though patients may have had symptoms for more than 10 hours, they can still have recovery of testicular parenchyma if the diagnosis is made expeditiously. There are some clues to partial torsion, which we'll talk about. Asymmetry in the Doppler signal is one of those clues. But what I have found more useful in the cases of partial torsion, which I have seen, which is not that common, is that you can oftentimes see that the epididymis itself is swollen or that the cord is swollen, and you can see the kink in the cord. So, for example, in this case of partial torsion, you can see that the left testis has a normal Doppler signal and waveform. It's much harder to demonstrate flow in the right testis, but there is demonstrable flow. But notice how, that we had to change our gain settings to a more sensitive level, and there's a lot more noise because the signal is so much weaker in this right testis. And when we image the right testis above the testis, we see this kink in the cord and the epididymis. And this is the actual knot of the torsion. This is commonly seen in cases of partial torsion. So what you really want to do when you suspect partial torsion is look carefully at the epididymis and the cord to see if you can see the twist itself. As I mentioned previously, testicular torsion is mistakenly considered to be the most common cause of acute scrotal pain in children, when in fact torsion of the appendix testis is a more likely cause of acute scrotal pain in a child. And Baldessarado, back in 2005, showed excellent examples of this, where the torsed appendix testis sticks out from the epididymis and testis like a swollen thumb, and it does not have any blood flow. And so this is what you want to look for in patients who have torsion of the appendix testis to make that diagnosis. Now again, this is a most common cause for acute scrotal pain in children. And because of the inflammation, there's hyperemia in the epididymis and even perhaps in the surrounding scrotal wall and the testis. You don't want to mistake this as acute epididymal orchitis because you've seen this swollen avascular appendix testis, you are able to make the correct diagnosis. Now, there's a limited role for MRI in testicular torsion. And in fact, in my practice, I've never actually done an MRI for testicular torsion. But I can imagine that in a confusing case, or in children in whom flow is difficult to demonstrate with ultrasound, MRI could be reassuring or diagnostic for torsion. So from the Watanabe article, we can see that here is an example of what we might look for. Uh, this is the T2-weighted image showing the testis being somewhat swollen the epididymis being somewhat enlarged and heterogeneous, and with Doppler, I mean, sorry, with uh, gadolinium enhancement, you can see that uh, the tunica of the scrotal wall is enhancing, but the testis and the epididymis are not enhancing on both the early and the late phase, and this is a case of acute testicular torsion. Let's turn our attention now to inflammation, which is oftentimes the competing diagnosis to the emergency room physician when presented with a patient with acute scrotal pain. Torsion, being more common in adolescents, is uh, different than epididymitis, which is usually more common in uh, the 
adults beyond adolescence. But there are overlapping instances of age range as well as overlapping physical and laboratory findings which result in confusion clinically requiring imaging to make the diagnosis. Because although epididymitis, as you might expect, will have skin edema and erythema, perhaps a fever, and pyuria, the same findings can be seen in torsion. Now this Netter diagram well illustrates why epididymal orchitis typically starts at the tail of the epididymis. And that's because epididymitis is generally a caused by retrograde spread of organisms from the bladder or the prostate gland. And so these organisms spread down through the vas deferens and get caught up in the filter of the epididymis at the tail, at this kink or bend. And so this is typically where epididymitis will begin. Now, epididymitis is the most common cause of acute scrotal pain. Again, as we discussed, it's due to the retrograde spread of organisms from the bladder and prostate, and therefore it's usually confined to the epididymis in about four out of five cases. There can be coexisting orchitis, or inflammation of the testis, in the other one-fifth of the cases. Primary orchitis, where you have inflammation of the testicular parenchyma, but not the epididymis, should raise in your mind a different possibility, and that is a viral uh, I'm sorry, viral orchitis or mumps orchitis, uh, which gets deposited and seeded through a hematogenous origin rather than this retrograde spread. And that's why it'll oftentimes involve the testis without involving the epididymis. The sonographic findings in epididymitis are that the epididymis becomes enlarged and hypoechoic. The echogenicity is actually quite variable, but the enlargement... Uh, is also variable, can be focal or diffuse, uh, but the key diagnostic criteria that we use is uh, from the color flow. So uh, although the epididymis grayscale findings can be suggestive and the testis grayscale findings can be suggestive where there can be focal enlargement or diffuse enlargement of the testis, as we see in this case where the testis is hypoechoic and enlarged compared to the other side, and the epididymis in this case is quite heterogeneous and in this case enlarged compared to the testis, the actual diagnosis is made on the color flow images. And so here we can see that there's a little bit of complicated fluid next to an inflamed epididymis uh, with some flow in the testis but much more flow in the epididymis. And likewise here, where there's skin thickening and a hypoechoic enlarged testis, the diagnosis is really established when we show that there's increased blood flow in that testicular parenchyma. So hyperemia is the diagnostic clue that we'll use to make the diagnosis of epididymitis and orchitis. And what we do is compare that hyperemia to the contralateral epididymis and to the ipsilateral testis. The normal epididymis does indeed show flow. And so in up to 20% of cases, epididymitis is only manifest as increased blood flow, not uh, enlargement of the epididymis. Since the normal epididymis does show flow, we have to understand when we would invoke the possibility of epididymitis rather than normal flow. And that occurs when the flow in the epididymis is greater than the flow in the testis and in the contralateral epididymis. So, for example, in this case, where the epididymis looks normal on the grayscale image, color flow shows us that there's much more flow in the epididymis than the testis, and that is not the usual condition. This shows that there's inflammation of the epididymis, and the patient has epididymitis. Sometimes, that can be a difficult assessment to make, especially since we start out with a low pulse repetition frequency meaning that we have the lowest Doppler scale. So this patient comes in, and if you were presented with these images and didn't know the clinical history, you would not be able to say whether the patient had epididymitis or not, and which side the patient had epididymis, uh, epididymitis on. Because, as we can see, at these settings, uh, with the 0.015 setting here, as we see on these color scales, we're seeing flow in the epididymis and the testis, in both the left and the right testis. And you can't really tell whether there's more flow in the epididymis than in the testis. So what we have to do in this setting 
is to change our pulse repetition frequency, change our scale, increase the scale, or in other words, decrease the sensitivity until we find out whether there's more flow in the epididymis or the testis. And when we do that, as we do in this case, so here with the scale at the lowest scale that we can get at 0.015, we see flow both in the testis and the epididymis on both the left and the, on the right and the left. Sorry. When we've changed that scale and make it less sensitive, we can see that the flow in the epididymis is much harder to detect. We still have very good flow in the testis, so this is not a case of epididymal hyperemia. This is normal epididymal flow. Similarly, on the contralateral side, by changing the scale, we've lost the flow in the epididymis, but we've maintained the flow in the testis. So this is also normal. So this patient does not have epididymitis. Here, we've used comparison to the opposite side and also used comparison to the testis. So the tail of the epididymis here is not enlarged, but we can't tell from this image alone whether it's hyperemic. We might have the sense that there's more blood flow in the tail of the epididymis than the testis, but a far better way to make that assessment is to change the scale to make it a little less sensitive. And you can see that now, by making it less sensitive, we've lost the flow in the testis, but we've maintained the flow in the epididymis. So this patient clearly does have more blood flow in his epididymis than his testis, and so does have evidence of epididymal tail inflammation, and so has epididymitis. And if you compare to the opposite side, you can see that there's flow in the testis, there's no flow in the epididymis on the opposite side, there's still flow here on this side, and so that also helps us to make that diagnosis. Now, epididymitis and orchitis can lead to complications, and it's important to use vascular considerations to understand when you should suspect abscess and the complications of abscess and when you should suspect a different entity, namely infarction of the testis, which can be focal or diffuse. So this is an old image, but it nicely shows that the testis here on the right is being actually compressed by this heterogeneous collection in this patient who has right-sided epidermal orchitis and in fact has an abscess. So most abscesses are extratesticular, as we see in this case, a large heterogeneous septated fluid collection that is compressing the testicular parenchyma. Here, blood flow is demonstrable within this left testis, as we can see in this image, and spectral flow looks normal. That's all very reassuring that the left testis has not infarcted. This large collection is a big abscess that's exerting mass effect upon the left testis. That's in contradistinction to this case, where an intratesticular process is identified. And yes, there is what appears to be exuberant flow in the testicular parenchyma and no flow in this area. This could be an abscess in the testicle, but it's more likely to be a focal infarction of the testis, not an abscess. Infarcts in the testin are oftentimes, in the acute setting, round, as we see in this case. Here's another example. This patient has epididymitis with increased blood flow in his epididymis, also has a round mass that's relatively avascular in the testis. This is not an abscess. There is still some blood flow in this area, so this is not liquefied tissue. In fact, this is a focal infarct of the testis, path proven. Another case where the epididymis is not particularly enlarged, but is quite hyperemic. The testis, as we see on these two images, uh, the upper half and the lower half, is quite heterogeneous with this striated, heterogeneous, hypoechoic area. There is still blood flow in some of the more normal appearing testicular parenchyma. This is not a tumor. This is not an abscess, since we still see little flow bits within this area, this proved on surgery to be a fairly large area of infarction of the left testis. And we can get spe spectral Doppler clues as to this entity. So this heterogeneous testis in a patient who had inflammation of the left epididymis, when we put color flow on, we see reversed flow in diastole. 
This is a hallmark of microvascular coagulation. What happens is, in the infarcted area, in this case, practically the entire testis, the small microvasculature coagulates, and so blood flow comes towards that, those small vessels, can't go anywhere, and much of it, or some of it, comes backwards, and that's why we see this reverse to-and-fro flow. Another case where the left testis is heterogeneous and enlarged, uh, and color Doppler spectral analysis shows that we're getting a significant amount of reverse flow in diastole. This is a patient who has an infarcted left testis, as proven on pathology. So you want to suspect abscess when you see an extratesticular heterogeneous fluid collection, oftentimes with some mass effect on the testis. And be sure to check the testicular blood flow to see whether it's impinging upon testicular blood flow because that would be uh, an indication for immediate surgical treatment of the abscess. You want to suspect infarction when you see an infiltrative or even a mass-like area in the testis that may have some focal pore flow or has reverse diastolic flow in the setting of inflammation. So let's now turn our attention to evaluation of masses or suspected masses and how vascular considerations play a very important role in the evaluation of those findings. Now, I'm going to talk primarily about infarction, but clearly you can make specific diagnoses when you combine the vascular considerations with the imaging appearance. And so lymphoma and plasma cytoma is a quite vascular nodule that might exist within the testicle. Epidermoid cysts have no vascularity, and so if you see an onion skin uh, or rounded mass with layers that has no blood flow, you might consider an epidermoid cyst. And finally, a tunical adenomatoid tumor can be facilitated in its diagnosis by evaluating the vascularity and showing that this is actually on the capsule of the testis underneath a capsular vessel, I mean, I'm sorry, overlying a capsular vessel rather than underneath the capsular vessel. But again, as I said, I want to turn my attention primarily to evaluation of testicular infarcts. There are multiple causes for infarcts, torsion, inflammation, trauma, embolic phenomenon, and vasculitis. And these are oftentimes confused for a possible neoplasm. There are some features which clearly suggest infarct on the grayscale images. That would be when you see a band-like area or a zonal area of abnormality, typically with concave margins. The involved testis may be small, and especially if you see these sorts of things bilaterally, then I think you can be very confident that you're dealing with an infarction. So an image like this, where you see a band-like area of abnormality in the testis, is not a mass because masses do not grow in these stripe-like regions. Similarly, this has a similar appearance, where you have the testis and a band-like area with concave margins. That is not a testicular tumor because tumors don't grow with concave margins. This, based on the grayscale image, has a high suspicion for an infarct. But a case like this, where the testis is small, but there's a very heterogeneous area within the testis that isn't band-like, is one that would defy diagnosis without assessment of the vascularity. And in fact, this case where we, not we, but this is an outside image that was sent to me, um, where they suspected a um, mass in the testis proved to be an infarct at pathology. Here's a patient who comes in with acute pain, and you can see that there's a heterogeneous area in the upper half of the testis. And in fact, on the transverse image, the sonographer has taken care to try to mark out what she has perceived as being a focal mass in the testis. So at this point, with these calipers and with this area of abnormality, one might have predicted that we're dealing with a cancer. However, color flow helps us make the correct diagnosis because although we're seeing good flow within the normal testicular parenchyma in the lower half of the testis, we're not seeing any or very little flow in this upper half. That is not what we expect to see with the testicular neoplasm. And in fact, a testicular neoplasm, as we see in this case, where we see heterogeneity of the 
testis in a mass-like area typically has increased blood flow and certainly almost always has at least as much blood flow as the area around it. So a patient like this who has what looks like two discrete masses within the testis, when we put color flow and we see that there is not any blood flow in these areas should raise your suspicion for focal infarcts, not testicular neoplasm. And in fact, this is a case from the literature that shows uh, areas of necrotizing vasculitis in a patient who had a, a vasculopathy, uh, not uh, neoplasm. And so this patient would have benefited from further evaluation or consideration of the fact that there was no blood flow in these apparent masses did not need to go on to this orchiectomy. So when testicular infarct is a consideration, I believe MR can be quite helpful. Now, in this talk, I'm talking about MRI, but once contrast in ultrasound becomes more prevalent and available, especially in the United States, I think that contrast-enhanced ultrasound can supplant MRI in the evaluation of these suspected infarcts. I'm going to be talking about MRI, but where I talk about MRI consider that you might be able to apply contrast-enhanced ultrasound to find the same diagnosis. So we use MRI when the ultrasound findings are suspicious for tumor, but the Doppler does not support that suspicion. In other words, where we think there's a rounded mass, but there's no increased or even as much blood flow in that area as in the surrounding normal appearing testicular parenchyma. We can use MRI to quantify the degree of vascularity and to evaluate the margins and extent of the abnormality. And by using this, we can alter management. The reason why contrast-enhanced imaging can play such an important role in distinguishing between tumors and infarcts is obvious. This is from the Watanabe article, and you can see that when we talk about how fast things enhance, malignancies in the testis enhance much faster than the normal testis, there's no overlap, and clearly are distinguished from infarcts which do not enhance as much as normal testis. Likewise, malignancies enhance more than normal testis for the most part, in fact in all of Watanabe's series, and this is clearly different than infarcts which do not enhance as much as the normal testis. And so the fact that these areas of infarction are so different than areas of neoplasm with contrast enhancement allows us to use contrast, whether it be within MR or ultrasound, to help make the diagnosis when suspected. So here is a case from Watanabe's article. Uh, you can see that this heterogeneous mass on the T2-weighted images in the left testis has early enhancement, so it enhances faster, and enhances more than the normal testicular parenchyma, both in that testis and in the contralateral testis. So this is clearly a tumor. And here's an example from our case. You can see, from our, our cases, you can see that uh, the left testis here enhances much faster than the right testis and enhances more than the right testis, and so is suspicious for a possible neoplasm in the appropriate setting. And in fact, this wasn't a diagnostic dilemma on the ultrasound. This is that right testis, uh, I'm sorry, left testis, and you can see that the mass is clearly obvious, has increased blood flow, so why would we even do any contrast-enhanced imaging here? The reason we did contrast-enhanced imaging in this case with MRI is because the contralateral testis had a heterogeneous area within it. It does look somewhat band-like, and it did not have increased blood flow. But in the setting of a patient who has a contralateral testicular malignancy, we needed to worry a bit about the possibility of a synchronous lesion on the other side. And so the MRI shows us that the testis, which is smaller than the tumor-filled testis, has a band-like area that does not enhance as much as the other testis and is, has the characteristic shape of an infarct and we're able to prevent having to do a bilateral orchiectomy in this patient uh, who has a unilateral testicular neoplasm. So if we go back to this case, again, this is an area in the upper half of the testis that may have looked somewhat nodular and mass-like, 
but with color flow, the Doppler did not support the possibility of malignancy in this area. To prove that, we did a contrast enhanced MR. You can see that there's an area of dark signal on the T2, so we're already thinking that this is not a neoplasm. And on these images, the early and late subtraction phases, you can see that this area of the testis doesn't enhance as fast and doesn't enhance as much as the normal testis and is an area of infarction. So we were able to save this patient from having to have an orchiectomy or surgical evaluation of this infarct. Another case, is this a mass or an infarct? On the grayscale image, I challenge anyone to not be suspecting the possibility of a mass. This looks like a mass with some concave, I'm sorry, convex margins. However, on color flow, the Doppler signal did not support the possibility of malignancy because there was much more flow in the surrounding testis than in this area of involvement. And so the MRI shows us on these enhanced axial and sagittal images that this area did not enhance as much as the lower testis. I'm not showing you the dynamic enhancement images which showed that this didn't enhance as fast as the normal testis. And on the T1 weighted images, we can see bright signal. This was an area of hemorrhagic infarction. Another case, a striated testis. This patient and in this case, the interpreting physician could not be sure that they weren't dealing with some infiltrative process, wanted reassurement. So Doppler was applied, and sure enough, we were not able to find much flow in this area. So that's reassuring that we're not dealing with the neoplasm. An MRI was performed to further confirm and allay the patient's fears that there was any problem. The lower half of the testis is not enhancing as much as the upper half, this is the area where we suspected a possible abnormality, and in fact, we can see some retraction of the capsule here. Another case, is this going to be a mass, or is this going to be an infarct? Without consideration of the vascularity of this, you will not be able to make that diagnosis. This has a rounded mass within the upper half of this testis, which could certainly be a neoplasm, but does not have the Doppler signal to support that possibility so you must consider the possibility of infarction. An MRI was performed showing that this area did not enhance as much as the normal testis. This is not a neoplasm, this is an infarct. And you can also get some other clues as to that possibility in that the left testis that harbors this area is smaller than the right, uh, and that's another feature. Is this a mass or is this an infarct? Well. Obviously, now you've gotten the point of, the, of all these cases. This is going to be an infarct, but the MRI, and in this case, uh, admittedly not the best-looking MRI, shows the area did not enhance as much in this axial MRI, uh, showing us the lack of enhancement of this area, which proved to be a hemorrhagic infarct. This is the MRI as well, showing the hemosiderin deposit on the edge of this T1 hyperintense. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not T1, but on this hyperintense area. How about this? This doesn't look particularly mass-like, but was somewhat firm on physical examination and very unusual in that it was, uh, you know, quite um, extensive. So uh, this proved to be not an area of dystrophic calcification, but a, a burned-out germ cell neoplasm. And we made that diagnosis because on the MRI, we wanted to assess the flow of the lesion the T2 shows a band-like area, but you can see here on the pre-gadolinium dynamics study, there's no T1 signal here. But then with the gadolinium injection, we see increased flow in this area on the early images. And so we must be concerned about the possibility of malignancy. This patient did go to the OR and had a burned-out germ cell neoplasm, and uh, this was written up in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine back in 2007. So vascular considerations can be very useful when considering a specific diagnosis, particularly when infarction is in your differential diagnosis. And again, I've shown you uh, many examples of how MR helps us in this regard, but I strongly suspect that as soon as contrast-enhanced ultrasound 
becomes something that we can all use here in the United States and perhaps is being used and is being used around the world, you can use contrast enhanced ultrasound to help with this same uh, thought process and evaluation. So my exhortation to you is to go with the flow. This helps us in evaluating suspected torsion, inflammation, and masses, particularly when the flow does not support the possibility of neoplasm. Thank you.